Hey everybody, this is Robot here, Best Motorsport San Diego, ScooterWest.com, part three of the engine rebuild for the Vespa 300. And again, uh, you might want to watch part one and two. Uh, if you're an expert mechanic, you could kind of skip through the videos, you know, just kind of get to the, the meat and potatoes of what you want to see. You don't necessarily need to watch the whole entire videos all the way through of me putting in every single fastener. But sometimes if, you're, if it's a first time that you're going to assemble something, it's good to see every single fastener go in. Uh, it's all up to you, but this part three is going to be putting the top end back together and jamming the motor back in the scooter and we'll be riding off in the sunset here in San Diego. What time is it? 5.30? Oh yeah, we'll make it in time for the sunset. Uh, pretty straightforward to put the top end and the motor goes in pretty simply. Uh, with this motor, we're reusing all the top end components. We just went in here to replace the, uh, the crankshaft. Uh, with the exception, I'm gonna replace the camshaft and the, the exhaust rocker because they did have some damage. But the top end had perfectly good compression. I mean, it was a little bit low because the, the big end bearing was blown out and it wouldn't crank all that fast, but the motor still had good power right up until the crankshaft uh, let go. All right, so you open up your gasket kit, you realize, whoa, got three base gaskets. Uh, they come in different thicknesses. You got four tenths of a millimeter, six tenths of a millimeter, and eight tenths of a millimeter. They're even marked, they like emboss the uh, thickness, but you can easily feel what the thickness of each of them is. Is what I've found is most engines I take apart, they have the middle one, which is 0.6. The reason they have different gaskets is to accurately set the uh, compression ratio. Uh, Technically, you could just probably put the 0.6 in, in there in most sit situations and you'd be fine. But since I replaced a critical component such as the, um, the crankshaft, I'm gonna go ahead and recheck the piston height relative to the surface of the cylinder itself. And that will, there's a measurement that you do that will determine what gasket you can use. Uh, there's a factory tool for this. Like I said, it's not super critical. I've found that you could probably put the 0.6 in in most situations. It's not going to be an issue. I mean, you're not going to run any issues if you put the thinnest one where the valves are going to come in contact with the piston. You may raise the compression a little bit so the scooter might be a little torquier than it should be and you may need to run better gas. But to get the uh, compression ratio right there, I think it's like 10 and a half to 1 for the 300, I'm going to do the measurement to figure out the exact gasket that I need and just show how it's done. So right now I have my piston. It doesn't have any of the rings installed in it. This is the piston we're gonna use. I'm gonna go ahead and install it with no rings and just put the, the pin in through the uh, connecting rod. Let me actually see what I'm doing. I'm working from the other side. I can't see what I'm doing. Kind of work the, the pin in. Usually these pins are um, Pretty straightforward, except for I'm putting it in the wrong direction. I remember that, I, I took the, the wrist pin off. So there's the arrow that points down. Usually I take the clip off from the um, other side, but I remember doing it a little different than I normally do. I'm gonna carefully drive the piston through the, um, the cylinder. Right now I have the, the engine pretty close to top dead center. And there's a little scribe at the very end of the uh, crank here, or the flywheel, and it corresponds to the little um, divot right next to that hole. And you could carefully r r draw a parallel line that uh, lines up with the line to kind of give you an indication, and that's pretty close to top dead center. Uh, next, I'm going to drop the cylinder on with no base gasket. I'm not going to install any of the base gaskets on it. I'm going to drop the, the cam chain through. And this is just, it's all to do, you know, it's, and we're just doing this, no rings on the piston, again. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I'm struggling with it though. There we go. So, get the piston shoved. Um, we gotta get the guide in there and the, the chain itself. Get it through the tunnel. 
you have a magnet, that, that makes the job a little easier if you want to grab the chain with a magnet or a needle nose. And I'll set that just like that. This is a special tool. And normally you'd put a dial gauge indicator in there. I found the tolerances are uh, two tenths of a millimeter. So it's not, uh, it's not a critical uh, measurement. So I have my, uh, just a regular um, dial caliper here. And I have this on a flat surface or a relatively flat surface. I mean, if I put it on a grinding block. So I'm going to set this down and then zero it. So now my measurement's zeroed. I'm going to take this tool and go across to the studs. It doesn't really matter which ones. I just find this one a little easier this way. And I know every, you know, the pistons have uh, variations between them on the, um, you know, 250s, 300s. So you may need to refer to the, uh, the factory service manual to get the exact measurements for, for deriving what base gasket you want to use. You know, again, th this is just a how-to video on kind of the steps. It, it's best if you do this along with um, a factory manual. So piston's pretty close to top dead center. I'm going to go ahead and let's see if I can. And let's see, we're 4.5. So what I want to do is And I'm going to start low. I want to have this perfectly uh, square with the, um, the surface here. And I'm going to crank the motor over real carefully. Go past top dead center. And we're right at 3.72. Let me check it again. So it looks like we can use the thinnest gasket. Let's try this again. Again, you get a little bit at more accurate reading if you do it with a um, 3.73. So if you look at the uh, what gasket you use, if you have 3.7 to 3.6, you're going to use a 4 tenths of a millimeter gasket. If you measured 3.6 to 3.4, 6 tenths, 3.4 to 3.2, eight tenths. So we can use the thinnest gasket on this engine with a combination of the crankshaft, the piston, the cylinder, the machining of the crankcase deck. All that determines the accuracy of the, um, or the, you know, this thickness of the gasket. 3.72 is 3.73. So, and essentially when I have this tool on the uh, table, a flat table top, I zeroed it out and I'm measuring the distance, you know, pretty much between uh, the flat of the surface and the, the very tip of the crown. Another way to go about this is if you had a flat piece of bar and drilled two holes on it and bolted it down to the, the, the top of your uh, cylinder here. Um, and you could go all the way up and try different combinations of fueler gauges that derive that measurement, the 3.7 to 3.2 measurement. And again, it's a little different for different engines, but that's another way to go about it. Um, or you could just give it a, a wild guess and just put a 0.6 in there and, and you'd probably be fine, never have any issues. So all up to you. I'm doing this in a sh professional shop environment, so I kind of want to do everything as per, you know, the factory recommendations and procedures, so that's while why I do it uh, this way with the factory tools here to check. All right, so I took apart the whole jig. I have the piston in my hand. There's an arrow that points down. Right now there's no clips in here. I'm going to go ahead and replace the clips with two new ones. Um, I want to put the clip on the side that, cam, that has the cam chain because that's a more difficult clip to gain access to when you're, um, once, you, once you get the, uh, the piston pin through. So I'm holding the clip with a needle nose. There's actually a factory tool for it and I prefer not to use it. It doesn't really work all that well. And there's a little groove right there. I know I'm kind of wiggling around a lot, but 
I kind of got to get my position. I'm hold, gripping this uh, clip quite good. I have my finger or my one finger in there. I'm hooking the clip right in the hole and I'm kind of just rotating the clip right into the hole. So I rotate it, drop my needle nose right in the hole and the clip went right in. And you double check all the way around, make sure that clip is in the groove because if it's not, the piston pin's gonna walk its way out and damage your piston. So I'm just putting the one clip in that is facing in front of the scooters on your left side. So, so there's the piston. You got your small arrow that's very barely visible on this used piston that points down. I'm gonna go ahead and put all the rings back on it. You know, the most critical ring is your top ring for the compression. And you could drop them into the cylinder and use your piston and you can measure that gap. You can see that very fine gap. I would say it's about the thickness of a hair. I've already checked all the gaps against the factory specifications and all these rings are well within uh, specification and I still see hone marks uh, all around the cylinder. So this thing is still in good serviceable condition, you know, including the rings. There's no gouges in the rings. I'm gonna take, if I can grab it with my gloves on, I usually do this without gloves on, but I'm gonna try with gloves on, give myself a little challenge. Got the arrow pointing down. You got this little springy thing and it comes off this little piece of wire here. If you wanna take it all the way off the wire, you could. Put it in the very, the furthest back groove. I don't know if the camera's focusing on this nice, but you kind of string that through and, and I'll get that down at the six o'clock position. Next, I'm gonna take my um, oil control ring. It's a very, very fragile ring. It's a one or two piece oil control ring. Uh, the Melosi kits and a lot of other pistons use uh, two really thin pieces of uh, steel for the uh, oil control. So what I'm gonna do is just carefully walk it all the way around. You know, be careful not to flex it and you've gotta get the, um, the groove of it underneath the uh, spring. So there it is, kinda just drop right in there and that spring puts tension on the, um, the oil control scraper ring as they call it. So I'm gonna leave that ring gap at 12 o'clock. My next ring, which is kind of a dull gray color when I removed it, I was careful to know the, the direction I have it. The printing, it says 2R. I don't know what that really means or anything, but the printing's gonna go face up. And I'm putting this in the middle groove, kind of just walking it around. It's kind of hard with gloves. And I'll put that at, I don't know, what's that, 4.30 or, or something like that. Uh, last ring is our um, top ring and it's an L section. If you look down at it, the flat part of the ring goes towards the top. And I hook that ring in and that one, the gap is somewhere like at 7.30, 8 o'clock, somewhere in that range. So top gap, bottom gap, and the oil scraper ring gap. I've cleaned the, uh, the cylinder and the parts washer, but you wanna give it one final wipe down before we put it back together. And you can see it still picks up some dirt and grime in there. You know, some of the carbon from the ridge, you know, the last little bit. So I went ahead and cleaned that pretty good, dried it out with a clean towel. I'm just gonna give it a little dribble of oil and wipe that the whole entire surface of the, um, the cylinder with oil. And it doesn't really need that much. You can wipe out the excess if you have too much oil. I tend, with the new cylinder, I usually put a very minimal amount of oil because I want the rings to seed in as quick, quickly as possible. So this is the top of your cylinder with the, um, the cam chain tensioner. You gotta, you gotta be really, really fragile with, you know, careful with these rings. So that one, drop down. 
and the second ring drop down. I'm just using my fingers to kind of um, drop those in. So, and then the top ring is going to be your most difficult one. So, kind of squeeze it in there. And it's what I'll do sometimes is use the back of a pit, uh, screwdriver. Never want to use a hammer. And just give it little baby taps. And there we go. So all the rings are, are, are stuffed in there. All right, so I'm going to take my piston pin, oil it up. And like I suggested, I got the gap is on the the side where the cam tunnel is, or the, the clip, excuse me. Take a little bit of the oil, put it on the skirts here. Now the piston's ready to go on, so. I take my .4 gasket, I'm gonna go back to the, the cylinder, or the, the engine case. And like I suggested in previous um, sections, sometimes I would replace these studs. These studs are in perfectly good shape. Uh, Piaggio doesn't have any requirement that they need to be replaced on the 200, 150, 300 motors. They, if you're doing the 350, which is kind of a completely different motor, they do recommend replacement. And the surfaces are all cleaned. I'll go ahead and put the dowel in there. I'll squirt some oil on the, um, the big end. Just like in those grooves, kind of give it a little pre, pre oil. The one uh, dowel is still in the uh, in the piston. A lot of times, if they're rusted, you'll end up destroying them, removing them. I'm just going to leave that one alone. I installed the dowel down there, so that's good to go. And I'll line this up with the studs. Make sure our guide gets in there. Lift the uh, the wrist pin or I mean the connecting rod. Get my needle nose and pull the, um, the cam chain out. Here's a trick I've always done. I just set my needle nose in there because I'm going to need the needle nose soon anyways. Um, so, back here, you could steer the piston a little bit and you can wiggle. You know, from the back side, you can see where the, uh, and let's see, it's, I'm trying to stay out of the way of the camera because I normally would want to do this from the right side of the motor. There we go. So just carefully tap the, uh, the pin in there. Maybe it wasn't the best idea to use. Um, usually I'd slide that down a little bit. Drive the, um, the pin all the way in. Sometimes they're a little difficult. If you heat up the piston a little bit, it would go in a little bit easier. Very, very small taps. If, if you're struggling with this, you're going to need a uh, a piston pin puller, which is what I use when I tore this uh, motor apart. Get the other new clip. If you're uh, not confident on your ability to hold the clip, I would shove a rag in there. And again, just like I did on the uh, other side, just curl the clip right in there and put it in the uh, groove. Verify it's in the piston groove all the way around. And voila. So now we could carefully get the, uh, the piston back into the cylinder here. You might want to have a small mallet just to give it a little, little taps, you know. You know, don't, don't slam on it with anything. You know, if you break the rings and it's game over, you gotta go back, get a new ring. You can see, I can see the pistons kind of going a little bit crooked. 
So I'm gonna pull this out a little bit until I just expose the oil control ring. And I can see the oil control ring under here. And like I said, that's the most difficult ring. So I'm gonna kind of have to reshove it back in there. Of course, it's so much easier if, if you just get it all, all in in one, one step, you know. Give it a couple taps. Watching the gap close up on the oil control ring. There we go. Don't worry if the piston uh, is no longer in top dead center. So there we go. So you got your guide there. The two dowels are in place. And go ahead and just seat the, um, the cylinder. And one thing with the, uh, I, I stated that the piston is matched to the cylinder, but there's not oversizes available. On the top of the crown of the piston is a zero or a O, and then engraved in the top of the cylinder is a, a zero as well. And that just indicates that the clearance is for both the, um, both the piston and the cylinder have been determined by the manufacturer when they uh, checked all the tolerances or whatever they do. So now I'm back to hooking my um, thing. So I'm gonna bring this back to top dead center and I got my mark. It's pretty close right there. I'm gonna have brake parts cleaner and just wipe all these surfaces. Any oil residues that you may have left behind. You make sure these surfaces are perfectly clean. Yeah, even the rag leaves, leaves behind like little filaments of um, fibers or whatever, whether they're cloth rag or paper rag. You know, the um, surfaces of the cylinder head and the cylinder are um, very uh, tightly machined, you know, so, so any imperfections would cause uh, leakage especially under the high pressure it is. I cut a little top of a bag, like if you take a bag and snip the corner of it, and I'm gonna put that over the studs. Next, you got these uh, four O-rings, these uh, stud seal O-rings, because the water passage goes around uh, the cylinder studs on this model, or I don't know, most Piaggio models. So you wanna put a small amount of grease on each of these O-rings, and the whole idea of the bag is it protects the o-rings when it's going over the threads. And I'm just gonna get all the o-rings. Got a little grease on my finger. It doesn't, you don't need much grease at all. So with these uh, stud o-rings, you just wanna slide them down the smooth section of the stud once they're past those, the threads with the bag. And just use, this, this is a pick that doesn't have a tip on it. You could use a flat bladed screwdriver. And I'm steering the studs around and you could just kind of drive the uh, o-rings into it. Keep in mind this, this boss and this one are deeper because there's gonna be a dowel that drops into those um, recesses. Again, make sure you didn't accidentally get any grease smeared over top of anything there. So I got the two short, kind of larger size dowels that are specific to the head. And I'll drop those on these two diagonal studs. I'll take this, the specific head gasket that's for the 300. And it's indicated because they mark it with the embossed 300. The only difference if I showed you a 250 gasket is the bore's a little smaller. So we got the gasket ready to go. I got this guide, just drops right down like that. You can see the um, two little like ears fall right into the, uh, the grooves that are machined in the head. This gasket, you technically could put it this direction, but it's gonna uh, bind up with the dowels. But the telltale is this oil hole right here. So flip it over, the oil hole lines up with this hole right here. So temporarily take my uh, cam chain holding device out and drop that on. This is already a uh, checked out head. I found nothing leaks on it. There's no issues with it. So we're just gonna reassemble it. To check these heads for flatness, the one thing is the, uh, the valves 
protrude a little bit. You can never check these for flatness unless you remove the valves. You can put them on a flat, flat surface or, uh, you know, if you're going to machine it, you can't do it with the valves in there. I mean, you can see that the valves just uh, stick out ever so slightly. Um, another gasket, if you wanted to replace it, this gasket's in perfectly good shape. I'm not going to bother. This is pried out with like a flat screwdriver or a seal tool, and you could replace that copper gasket if you like. Say if the exhaust has been removed a number of times, maybe worthwhile replacing it. And I kind of tip it on from the bottom just to keep the uh, cam chain from dropping back down the, um, the valley for the... So again, everything's, it's still set at top dead center. Nothing's moved. Cylinders drop down. You got these eight millimeter nuts, need a 12 millimeter head. I'll go ahead and take the deep socket, spin them all on. And I'm just, uh, just threading them until they, uh, they stop, you know, just basically hand tight. So repeat with all four. And sometimes kind of blow it, drop one around. Another way, if you want the, uh, the nut to stay in the socket, just dab it with a little bit of grease. Or a lot of times you can hold it almost till the end and then drop it right on. Uh, you can magnetize the tool to hold it in place. Many different ways to kind of hold a nut in place while you're um, trying to um, get it threaded on. Uh, with these uh, studs, if they're brand new studs, you need to, uh, there's a different torque sequence for brand new studs versus used studs. For new studs, you want to torque each of them, all uh, four of them in a crisscross to seven newton meters the first round, then a the second round at 10 newton meters, and then you'll have three rounds of 90 degrees. So, so a total of 270 degrees on each of the nuts divided up in three steps. And I'll show you how to go about that. And that's with new ones. If they're used studs, you only torque them to seven newton meters, you skip the 10 newton meters, and then you do the uh, 270 degrees. Uh, so it's a different procedure whether they're new or used um, studs. Now this is where you're gonna need a torque wrench. You don't necessarily need a fancy one. You need one that's at the lower end of the scale to do um, seven newton meters. So there's seven newton meters, I already have it programmed in there. You know, seven newton meters is like five foot pounds or something like that, four and a half. So, it doesn't take much, just a little bit. So seven, engage it on the nut, it would help. There we go. Seven newton meters. And one thing with the torque wrench, right when it clicks or uh, that indicates that you've hit the torque, stop turning, because you'll continue to torque even further, and that's not going to do you any good. So uh, the next step is the 270 degrees. You don't necessarily need to have an angle uh, style torque wrench to do that. You could just do it with a regular socket. And I'll show how the, the torque wrench works, because it's kind of fun to use fun tools. But say if you want to do 90, I'm just going to pretend. I'm going to start the wrench right about there, pull it 90. Pull at 90, pull at 90, pull at 90, and do that three, uh, two additional times. So, you know, 90, 90, 90, so you end up turning this a total of 270 degrees. But the way this torque wrench works is let me put it in a calibration mode. So it has a little calibration sequence, and on the display it says 90 degrees. It just makes the job a little easier. It does the calculation for you. So 30, 40, 45, and I can come back out, and 90. So there's 90. One thing you got to keep in mind is the motors, now that we're torquing, is kind of wanting to, um, to drop the motor.
90. So there's my first round of 90s. Now I'm doing the 180. So another 90 will give us the 180. And with a more sophisticated torque wrench, it gives you uh, the ending torque. So right now we're at 19 foot pounds. I find that the last one's usually right around 25 foot pounds or 20 newton meters, something like that. So I'm gonna do my net last round of 90s. So 27 foot pounds is the result, but that's not, a, you know, doesn't really tell us much. 24 foot pounds about. 23 foot pounds and 24 foot pounds. So they're all pretty evenly torqued. I mean, technically, if you just torqued them in steps of 24 foot pounds, you probably end up with the same thing, but um, the torque angle is how they specify torquing these um, head bolts. Take your two long uh, cam chain tunnel bolts, just torque these to about 10 newton meters, seven and a half foot pounds. And I got a couple too many sockets out. So it's starting to look like a complete motor now. Duh. And again, if you want, you just do that, or you could get a torque wrench out. So there we go. So I got my, uh, my brand new camshaft. I've always noticed that like the 300s, they have a little plus engraved in them. I'm not sure if it's any type of indication, but the 300 ones have a plus. There's other ones that have like a dot engraved in them. I think it's just some way to indicate you know, what they are without measuring the lobes. Uh, if you physically look at a 300 cam to a 250 cam, you can see that they got a longer duration of lobes and they have a little bit more lift. Um, I'm gonna take the new cam, it's all cleaned up. You know, make sure there's no residue. You wanna just goop this thing up with a uh, assembly loop. You know, you can get pretty liberal with it. Goop it up. Same with the uh, journals that are in the head. And I'll go ahead and slide the cam in with the little holes facing up, which is about top dead center, somewhere in that range. So got the cam slid in there. Uh, one thing with the rockers, we were going to replace the exhaust rocker because it does have some damage on it. You, know, you can't accidentally mix up the, the rockers. I'll show you how this works. So intake lines up perfectly. If you end up putting the intake on the exhaust side, see how it doesn't line up with the, uh, the valves. But we know the intake's good, so, uh, and I have my adjusters already loosened. So, so otherwise, you know, sometimes you can't get the pin in there. Um, this rod, you could put a small mount assembly lube in there. Slide that in there. And our new exhaust rockers right here. And you can see the adjusters are backed off. And I even like putting the rod in the same way. So drop that in there. Use some of the other assembly lube. Don't need to squirt any more of it. So these are very loose right now. We'll put the thrust plate on. It is symmetrical, but you can tell by the, uh, the markings on it. I'm just going to put it the same way it came off. All right, so we're going to start assembling the cam chain and decompression system. This little guy, sometimes they're fully round. Um, it's got Mickey Mouse ears with one ear that's a little bit smaller. Uh, the larger ear goes over this dowel. The center dowel is obviously the center dowel. Nice thing with the ones with a flat is you line it up where it's parallel with the top of the, um, the head. That's a pr close approximation to top dead center. Next, you want to take the sprocket. There's going to be multiple marks on this as well. You want to have the marks out. 
this, this mark with the hole is four valves. Sometimes they don't have the, the hole, so you can ignore that sometimes. And two valve is for a motor such as the LX uh, 150 ET4 125, Typhoon 125. They'll use that as a reference for the top dead center. But since we're doing the, this is a four valve motor, I'm gonna uh, approximately try to drop the cam chain on so it's, it's about pointed at top dead center. And it looks like I got it. Say if you were off a little bit, you could carefully pull this off and derail the chain and move it, move it around. And now I can tell that the mark is one whole cam tooth off. But I'll go back that direction and pop it on there. I'm gonna hold it with the motor at top dead center. See I'm off actually. Now I'm even one tooth this way. I think I did notice I went about two teeth on it. So put your finger in the uh, tensioner. Make sure that arrow is very accurately uh, lines up with this mark right at the top when this, the crankshaft is adjusted at top dead center. Next, you want to take this counterweight, kind of lines on the two dowels that are right here. And then there's this single screw that needs a four millimeter Allen. And this isn't tightened all that, that tight, maybe four or five foot pounds. You can hold the uh, flywheel without even having the cam chain in there and just snug it tight and you'll be fine there. This is your counterweight. This is the original washer. For some reason with the gasket kit, they do include a new little um, washer. If you're worried about losing this washer, because it, it, they're pretty easy to drop down the engine, down this cam chain tunnel, you put a little grease on it, then it's not gonna fall off. So you can grease that little stud there, or the little, that's the, um, the flat that will act on the exhaust valve that allows the engine to have a little bit lower compression when it's cranking, cranking over at cranking speed. Take this spring here, it kind of looks like that. Put the spring on, you hook it on this lobe, see how this lobe is movable? And then just bring the little ear all the way around. And it will stay in place without the uh, cover. So you can see the ear here and the ear, ear is on this lobe here. Here's how to check the operation. Make sure it returns on its own and you're doing good. Depending on the year, some of them have like a large bell that goes, looks like a little bell that goes over the whole thing or a small version of the clutch drum. Uh, the later engines just have this little, uh, this disc, make sure the spring's all the way on there. It lines up like such. And again, it's six millimeters, around seven and a half, 10 newton meters, seven and a half foot pounds, 10 newton meters, somewhere in there. Hold it, and just give it a crank. So you can see there's a little free play in there. We're gonna take the uh, cam chain tensioner and the associated gasket that goes with the cam chain tensioner and install this guy. So we got the cam chain tensioner. Some of them have an O-ring here, some have a copper washer. Uh, that part isn't included in the gasket kit for some reason. And I spoke about how to check your cam chain, um, the condition of your cam chain when you're pulling out. You know, if it's all the way out, it might mean you have a stretched cam chain. If it's somewhere like that, when you pull it out without the spring in there, that's a pretty normal, um, it's still well within its range of adjustment. But we need to reset it. So is what you do is push your finger on that little tab and push it all the way back in. You got the single gasket, only uh, orientates itself one way. And you could drop the, um, the tensioner right, in, right into its spot on the cylinder. Put the two screws. So there and there, drop the small spring down and just listen very, very uh, quiet. You'll hear the, um, that little ratcheting motion was the cam chain adjuster adjusting to its uh, correct tension. So now there's no free play in the cam chain. 
And as the cam chain wears, it will, you know, one click at a time, it will adjust itself. So you can turn the motor over. You know, I'm turning this, if you're on, facing the, the uh, flywheel, it would be clockwise. There's a lot of compression because I do have the uh, spark plug in there. So it's a little hard to turn over. And since I've got to replace the spark plug, I'm going to just go ahead and pull that out. 5 8 uh, wrench. Of course, it's much easier to do when the... Um, And again, it's just a good idea to replace it. I'm sure the plug still has life on it. It looked okay when I inspected it through the head and had it out for a compression check, but also makes the engine a little easier to turn over. So you can see it's done acting on the intake valves. It's coming up and I'll just line up the arrow to this. We're gonna go ahead and set the valves. I'm gonna get, uh, a four thousandths and a six thousandths feeler gauge, um, which is a ten hundredths of a millimeter and fifteen hundredths of a millimeter. I want to get eight millimeter uh, wrench and a very small, not a very small, a medium small flat blade screwdriver. So with these tools, I'll be able to adjust the valves. And again, if you don't already have the lock nuts loose, you want to go ahead and free them up. Again, that, that's easier when you're installing the cam, oftentimes you want to do that. So I'm going to put the uh, four thou feeler in there. And it almost feels perfect. It's actually just dragging ever so slightly. So loose the lock adjuster and right where it stops. I'm not even putting any resistance on it. So get the wrench back on. There is special tools that hold, you do this whole motion in one shot, but to show how you do it with the regular old tools here. That one's a little on the tight. See how it really drags through there? So I wanna, there we go. Now it's good. Just drags just ever so slightly and that's what you want. And you can just hear it snap a little bit. Don't forget a loose valve is a happy valve. Uh, these ones are very, very loose because it's a brand new rocker. And is what I tend to want to do when they're brand new is get them both approximate to the right adjustment. So there we go. So that one's good. Get the lock nut there. Drags just perfect. And again, the exhaust is on most, most engines, it's always a little looser because they run warmer, so they need more clearance. Okay. And that one's good there too. All right, we can put the valve cover on. Uh, one thing you want to do is put a little oil in those two little well holes. There's a little cavity that's a cup for the oil. I mean, the cam does have assembly lube on it but just give it a little pre-lube um, for startup, just kind of prevent metal to metal on it. Uh, we're gonna get the valve cover, we're gonna put new gaskets on it. So I took the valve cover completely apart. This is the breather cap. There's an O-ring that goes with the breather cap that seals the breather cap. There's all the screws that go on the valve cover. There's the valve cover gasket itself, very simple and self-explanatory, just drops right in. It's a custom molded gasket. And let me get my face out of here. So all these little donuts here are the seals for the, the valve cover bolts. Um, if you like, you could put a little grease to hold the gasket in place. You put a little grease on the gasket if you like. Uh, I've never really seen these have too many problems. Pretty reliable design. Drop the uh, head on there. Kind of holds it in place on its own for a second. And you can get all these bolts just started. Yeah, don't just tighten one of them. You've got to get them all started with the brand new donuts in there.
take your 10. These aren't too critical on the torque, but the idea is you feel the rubber of the, um, the donuts compress, and then when, they're, when the bolt bottoms out, that's when you stop turning. So it uses the rubber tension to kind of seal the, um, the valve cover here. And I feel the resistance when the, the rubber contacts, but pretty much turn it and it stops. Has like a positive stop feel to it and that's all you need to go. Don't need to tighten any tighter after that. So. This little O-ring right here gets a little grease in this groove. Kind of got a little wacko with the grease here, but doesn't need that much, but whatever. Not gonna hurt anything. Put the, uh, the O-ring in the groove. T20 uh, Torx. And if you're, for some reason, I don't know why you'd ever have to replace your valve cover, but uh, these holes aren't threaded. So these uh, screws, they self-thread and they're very, very tight for the first time. Um, since they've already been installed, they're not, not so bad. Hands are a little too greasy for the the Torx fastener here. Yeah, there's still a little resistance on them. But, oh, well, you know what? I didn't even pick the right uh, Torx driver. I think I have it out. That's what my problem is. Here it is. I think this is the correct one. T20, sometimes they're T25. This one's actually T25. I have taken a part where they had T20s. So they've used different variations of the uh, fasteners. And again, just kind of go between the two. and gooing the grease out. There we go. So remember, there's no engine oil in this thing and there's no gearbox oil in it. Uh, the worst thing you could do is start a brand new built fresh motor with no oil and realize after like two minutes of running or a minute of running, like, why is the motor noisy? Why is the, uh, the oil light not going off? And um, not a good thing to find out. Uh, I'm going to pull the little O-ring out of the thermostat. This is that little O-ring that's going to get replaced. And bolt the thermostat in place. So you got this huge bag for this little O-ring. And somewhere in 2011, they started using this larger O-ring. Uh, inside the uh, the gasket kit, they do include the older style O-ring, which is a little smaller. Um, you know, this newer one's a much larger, seals a little bit better. So you can see the larger O-ring here's on 2010 and earlier, they have a smaller O-ring. So we're not gonna use the smaller O-ring that's included with the kit. Use a larger one. So a small amount of silicone on there, on the rubber gasket, and that's sealed up. Don't worry about the new O-ring, it will seal just fine. We'll set the thermostat cover in place. I mean, sometimes I've found that these covers just don't seal. I just have to replace them. And that's one downside. The, the fiberglass reinforced uh, plastics that are used on engines, I mean, modern car engines use them all over the place. If they're ever overheated, they're usually permanently damaged. Well, aluminum might warp or something, but usually is is salvageable and they use these uh, high quality plastics they're great quality but they use them to save weight um, sure it costs it's a lot cheaper to um, to manufacture a plastic part versus aluminum casting with second op machining so that's all back in thermo sensors in place we're all good we know we're at top dead center i'm going to put the um the water pump cover on 
and do a last couple little things on that um, right hand uh, engine cover. So I'm going to go ahead and bolt my uh, stator plate and pick up back into the um, the right hand water pump cover as they call it. And these are, uh, you'll need a five millimeter uh, Allen. Tighten the three center bolts on the stator. For the most part, I find these stators are quite reliable. Not too many issues with them. All right, get the pickup in place. Some variations over the years on how the pickups went in there. So the little Phillips screws, I'm not gonna bother putting Loctite or using any power drivers, but you definitely wanna make sure they're snug when they're installed. Just tighten it about as tight as you can with a hand screwdriver there. Take your silicone and on these uh, wire seals, you want to put a small amount of silicone. You'll see that they've, from the factory, the, the well is kind of full of silicone to begin with. So that's just the seal, the wires. So I'll drop it into those the two V's of the uh, seals there. You can see it gooping out. I'll put a little bit more on the, uh, the rubber seal itself and mainly the points where it intersects to the metal right there. So the stator's all ready to go. Um, I'm gonna take the stator gasket. And either silicone or grease, I'll just use a little bit to hold it in place. So the gasket seems to want to stay just fine. See the two dowels are already there. They don't easily remove. Um, next is this water pump drive spring. And the idea is I put it in, it, it slides into the slot of that nut. And then you kind of, you aim this towards that shaft. And the reason being, so it's aimed as close as I can to the shaft. That shaft goes in this little boss right here. So the slot on this water pump drive, I'll aim the slot right towards this, this, that, that boss right there. So that gives me a good reference that's gonna be engaged when you put it back together. It does a lot of damage when you just jam these on and I've seen it happen. It makes a lot of bad noises. It could ruin the uh, bearings in the water pump. That spring will usually get ruined. There's nothing else that needs to go inside that case. The magnets of the flywheel are gonna really wanna pull it on. So kind of have it be prepared for it to want to pull the um, pull the flywheel on to the uh, the engine there, and you can see see how that just has a little free play. That's perfect. That's just the way it should be right there. I'm going to take all the screws that hold the um, the cover on. They're all eight millimeter. You got the one long, 112 millimeter screw, and if I recall, it goes in that hole there. You got a uh, one that holds part of the wiring harness, goes in that hole. You got the O2 sensor bracket, it's lower hole here. And all the rest, just they're all the same. So you can go to town, make sure you don't pinch the wires. Uh, that's a, tr uh, a mistake that can be made easily. Hopefully you catch it. And now I'll take all these eight millimeter fasteners, starting with this one that's got the pesky bracket. Just hold the bracket up in place. So just snug them first. I'm just 
that's not in the groove there. You can see the silicone oozing out right there, that's normal. I'm going to replace the O-ring that's on this um, timing plug that's included in the kit. The same O-ring size is used on the um, oil dipstick. I have the oil pressure sensor, a brand new crush washer. Could technically uh, prime the oil system, pump oil through this hole to get everything pre-lubricated. I don't see that being really all that necessary. Need a 21 millimeter socket. And you gotta be careful with these oil sensors. They're like a brake banjo. They can't be over tightened because they are a, they're a hollow um, shaft on them that allows the oil to go through. So this, this is the wire for the, um, the oil pressure sensor. Definitely make sure it's cooked up. You can verify that when you first turn the ignition on, when the screw's all hooked up, that the oil, oil light is off, or the oil light is illuminated before you first start the motor, very, uh, very important. We'll put the, um, the inspection plug. Oops, I think it's a T55 or T60, T55. And it does, it's just a plastic, uh, fastener so it doesn't need to be tightened all that tight. Just snug it right there and we'll get the spark plug in there. And I'm using the CR8 EKB which is the double electrode plug. Early motors didn't use this plug but this is, um, is a direct replacement. You don't need to gap these. They're just ready to go and they're the longest lasting. You know, the iridiums last quite a long time too, but you know, for the original plug, these ones last quite a long time compared to the original Champions or the single LaCroix um, NGKs that they originally came with. And a spark plug, you know, would I tighten it? Another 120 degrees if that, 90 degrees once it, it's seated. Uh, water pump's all good to go. We got our water pump that still has all the hoses. All these hose clamps are still tight. Um, you see there's a little corrosion in here. Perfect time to kind of scrape it off. If, if this thing's too bad, it might be just worth replacing it. The gasket, sometimes they come as a, just a round gasket that you need to use a little bit more grease to hold in place. Sometimes the gasket kits come with uh, one that's the shape of the snail. This one came with a snail one. Don't want to get too crazy with the uh, grease. Kind of got more than I should on here. But just to hold it in place, I'll wipe it out so it doesn't go into the coolant passage there. So now, now the O-ring is going to stay, stay, in, stay in place. I'm going to take our two uh, hose clamps. We need that uh, number six style hose clamp. And I'll put it like this so I can adjust it. If I ever need to tighten it, you can tighten it from the bottom of the, uh, the engine. This one, you can go from the top. Either way, it doesn't, it's not too critical. So you get the hose clamps on uh, or let it fall on the ground like I did. It doesn't do you much good. Now I'm just getting the hoses in place. You can see originally they got like a little zip tie with insulation on it. You can leave all that, that in place. Make sure the O-rings uh, doesn't come dislodged, otherwise you'll end up with a big coolant leak. And again, uh, I'm gonna have another video that's just on how to overhaul the water pump. 
as a separate thing. I mean, that's a maintenance thing that eventually, if you rack up enough miles, you're eventually going to have to do, do it because it's a wear item. Over time, the seals fail on the water pumps. Uh, one thing they turn at the crankshaft speed. Some water pumps, they turn at either camshaft speed or they're reduced, so there's not as much strain on the seal. But if you think about this, if these scooters are turning like 8,500 RPMs if you're motoring down the highway, and that mechanical, that water pump's turning at 8,500 RPMs too. So it's quite a bit, you know. Just go back, wipe all the excess grease. Um, then we can go and tighten the, make sure this, the hoses are all the way up against the, um, the thing. And I always, you always want to leave a little rubber for the, um, when you do a hose clamp, it's not right up against the, um, it's in between where there's the barb of the, um, that's on the, the spigot that the hose goes on and just hand tight is all you need to go with these. Hands are a little greasy. And you'll see on this one, I'll get it right in an ideal spot. So the engine's pretty much all together. With exception, I gotta get the brake, the wheel on, the swing arm, and the transmission. Um, before I roll it over to the scooter, I'm gonna put the, uh, the brake hub on temporarily to, and bolt the wheel on with just one fastener. Also, this customer is opting to have a new tire installed. This is a perfect time to change your tire since it's off the scooter. Um, even if it's has like 25, 30% life remaining, it would be a good idea to change it, start fresh. Uh, we'll get to that and I'll throw the motor in, fill the fluids, bleed the coolant system, and motor down the road. All right, so the motor's ready to roll right into the frame of the scooter. Um, kind of got the luxury of having two lifts, so I worked on the motor on this lift. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, I just, I bolted the wheel to the hub with just one, um, one fastener. It's still a little loose on the, um, the hub. It's just enough where I can use it like a wheelbarrow. And be careful that the motor does not um, pop off the center stand. That's also another, another problem there you don't want to happen. All right, so let's raise the lift. I got the jack stand under the center of the scooter, the front's clamped down, and that's the way I'm able to get the rear end up. Go ahead and drop that into place. It's a single fastener that I'm just gonna thread in a little bit because the bracket that for the, sen the wheel speed sensor uh, also goes underneath that. I have my engine pivot bolt ready to go. And I'm gonna slowly wheel the engine and lower the lift. So right now, you can see there's the rubber mounts, the two ears, and this ear will line up with that. So I'm gonna lower the uh, scooter frame as I um, get the motor in place. So lower the, uh, the frame a little bit. Sometimes you gotta push the air box and, and just make sure nothing gets damaged on the engine, you know, especially expensive components like the fuel injector. Um, and other parts. So I'm getting close. And now I can start eyeballing the, um, Sighting the uh, the bolt, and maybe the camera can get it, but it's very very close. And looks like I'm almost exactly where it needs to be. Obviously, very easy with this kind of setup. Um, doing this at home, you know, it's going to be a little bit more of a struggle if you don't have a lift. 
that's you know right at your right level. So I get the bolt through. You got this spacer here, and you may have to shift the motor towards the um, the right to get this uh, spacer in place. And the bolt's almost through. I'm gonna get my head in here and sight this bolt. Just lower it just a little bit and you'll see the bolt pop through. It doesn't get much easier than that. I mean, it's... So I got the 17 millimeter nut. See the hose closely lines up. There's some connectors, the spark plug leads right there. I'm just gonna put the nut on. You always gotta remember critical fasteners. Make sure you come back to them. You don't wanna leave anything like that loose. Next bolt I'm gonna to get to is, is before the air box goes on, you gotta put the shock bolt. Now start with the left shock here. So you got these two spacers that are identical. I centered the rubber bushing. And you can kinda of just do this as one motion. Kinda of lift. You can see I'm straining with it a little bit, but Get that there. And you can see the fuel line is in the, I'll show you everything at the top. The bungee cord's holding the throttle body, the air box. It's kind of, for the most part, out of the way. Got some fasteners here that we'll get to. Um, but for the time being, I kind of got the motor is situated. So and I'll show you the caliper. That can come right off. We can, uh, the temporarily uh, mounted tire can get removed now. You know, different, different arrangements have different uh, bolt setups for the uh, wheels. You see you got a brand new tire. I got the black uh, matching uh, wheel weights. Kind of clean the rim up. It's always a perfect opportunity to clean your wheel whenever you take it off for a tire job. Or, and you can see it wants to take the disc brake carrier carefully drag the wheel out. And we'll just put that right like that for the time being. And check this out. Scooter's uh, standing on its own now. Don't need a lift. So that, that all went pretty good. I'll tell you, if you're doing it any other way without a lift, like I said, it's gonna be a little bit tricky. And during a disassembly, I didn't bother removing all this stuff. I and mean, there's a lot of connections and a fuel line to disconnect. A lot of times when you disconnect a fuel line, just leave the scooter, it's gonna leak the fuel out. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove the single bungee that's kind of holding the air box, throttle body, intake manifold, fuel injector, all that, all the fun stuff. It's holding it down. Um, you see there's a lot of cables underneath. You know, I have the cables that we gotta get routed in the correct so that's your um stator connection the big one i just pulled out you got the starter connection which is kind of buried and you got to get all this stuff untangled kind of before we start uh connecting everything up so so that's your starter connection sorry to like throw it all around there um you got some connections for the fuel injector and for the thermo sensor. The, that one's a thermo sensor. You got your coolant line, your breather hose. I have the uh, brake hose out of the way. This is your um, wheel speed sensor. And that's gonna get routed um, all, all down. So we'll come back to that. But I kind of got everything draped in the general direction it needs to go. And down there is a spark plug cap. Um, this hose makes sure it doesn't come loose. I still got a piece of foam that's in the um, intake manifold. Very critical that the fuel line is routed underneath the intake manifold. See it's wiggling right there. Earlier models had uh, double, you know, two hoses. Um, and next I'm gonna just go ahead and bolt the intake manifold down. Uh, one thing, if you have an older manifold, you want to check this for cracks. The rubber, has, if it has any cracks, just replace it. They don't use a gasket between this. And if it's an older intake manifold, they're prone to leakage. And I would put a, uh, 
a nice coating of uh, RTV silicon sealant on this. Uh, this is a low miles, pretty new scooter. I don't believe there's going to be any issues with it. Um, we'll just kind of rest that over top of all that there and get the, um, the three screws that hold it. Go back to these ones. Good. Not all the way tight, but it's seated. All right. Just snug all these down. And voila. Intake manifold's now attached. So we're good there. This hose. You can see I just pushed a connection for that. This is your connection for the uh, fuel injection. It snaps right on, make sure that's tight and the clip snaps. This kind of wraps around here, goes past this. Sometimes if you put a new uh, sensor in there, it, the connector may be in a different position. You can kind of see it will only go in one direction. The kind of shield goes up and you'll hear a distinct click. That little click kind of indicates it snapped in place. Um, I've seen that connector broken quite a few times from mishandling or whatever, you know. Um, here we got, I got my battery lead or my starter lead. It's going to go underneath your throttle cables. We're going to have the number one ground strap at the starter motor. That's part of the main harness. Uh, that screw I left loose on the starter, previous step on um, part two or no, yeah, when I assembled the bottom end. Let's get the screw in there. Drop that in place. Very important, you always have tight grounds. Um, they have two grounds on these engines. Uh, they're a little bit of redundancy, but you don't want to be relying on one ground. Connection, it could, could cause issues. So under here is this clamp, this plastic clamp right here. And all the cables right around this area will go through this, um, including the starter lead. That I, see the red tape right there? That kind of indicates that, that it goes underneath a clamp or zip tied. Piaggio's kind of been doing that for years, like the, to kind of indicate the position of where, where cabling goes on, on the scooters. And I don't have the zip tie there. Remember I marked all my positions for where zip ties would go. I'm gonna go ahead and connect the starter connection back to the relay. So we'll get that zip tied under there when we're, we're close. Um, one more connection. I just see this red tape right here. That's your wheel speed sensor. It's pretty easy to uh, lift the, um, the connection. And then you got a clamp down here, another uh, wire clamp. And I'm kind of, I know my hands are in the way, but again, it's got the red tape. You got your O2 sensor connection. Make sure the little, the rubber protectors on there. Get that. We'll hook that up when we get the, in, the exhaust manifold bolted back up. And that also goes underneath this clamp here. And now you can see the clamp a little bit easier. It goes together with a nice distinct click. If any of these clamps are damaged, I would recommend replacing them. We stock all these um, these clamps here. You know, definitely a good idea to, to uh, replace any of them because otherwise you end up with a worn worn through wiring harness and other you know other damage. You know, and that's not a good thing. Up here is your um, this is your stator wiring. They've changed the arrangement of this on various years. This is the, the uh, this little slot slides onto that little track under here. Let's see if I can show it. I'm kind of fighting it with it right now. Sometimes I'll just pull the little clips out of the metal bracket, and then I can easily um, there we go. See it's in the slot. And then you can make the electrical connection right like that. Nice distinct click. 
Same with this connection right here. Very large, high power connection. So all these are now secure. This little thing can click in. And, and you can see there's a, a screw hole right there. And we'll get the, the single screw. Let me see if I can reach it. There we go. Let me get a Torx driver. All right, so T30 Torx driver. And make sure it goes straight down into the frame. This little metal clamp right there just closes down on the uh, cabling. You got, I put the one screw back in place. Some models have included this. Uh, the most recent ones, they stopped including it, but there's a, I don't know, three year span four, or five year span maybe. Maybe not even that much, four years, something like that, where they had this little cover. It's like just a little decorative co cover that cleans up the uh, wiring just a little bit. It doesn't really serve any function. Maybe it keeps uh, corrosion off the uh, connectors, you know, the, the, um, the charging connector that's kind of open to the air a little bit, but single, single screw holds that in place. All right, so we got some hoses here. Uh, make sure that's good, hose clamp. And I'm gonna grab some hose clamps here. There's my uh, number 12 style hose clamp. Pop the hose on. That's ready to be tightened. I got my air, air box breather, another uh, smaller hose clamp, number six hose clamp. See, I'm holding the clamp, the kind of, because I want the position of my, uh, if you don't hold it, see how the thing will just want to fall. You know, something maybe you don't think about, you know, if you're not wrenching all the time, you start finding little things that make jobs easier. And it would even be easier to turn out if I put a seven millimeter nut on the end. Because this, you can use a Phillips, a flat, or a nut driver on this style hose clamp. That's hand tight. You see all my gold marks for where I had zip ties. You need a screw for that. That's a, a five millimeter screw. And for some reason, this screw was missing when we took in the bike. So go ahead and replace it. It's a pretty critical screw. It kind of holds the. Um, the fuel line in place. I'm not sure why it was missing. And we're gonna also hook up our ground connection. So this is the ground wire that bolts. And Scott can't quite get it, but there's a single ground wire. And various years they've changed the position of this, but this, this, this year has um, redundant. It's got two times. Yeah. All right, so I got all the zip ties. The first one I like is it originally had like a little sheathing on it. So the sheathing's reusable. And that, that one goes around these two hoses here. Next one goes around the coolant hose and the EVAP hose, the hose that goes to the uh, evaporative emission system. That's on the frame. This one's kind of critical to put on because I've seen oftentimes where that spigot will come loose on the intake manifold. It's not a good thing. You'll need a long uh, zip tie. It's one that goes around a whole entire uh, boot. Does not go around your throttle cables, but goes around all the wiring that's tied to the back of the, the zip tie. That drives me nuts. Every once in a while I see somebody else like takes one of these bikes apart and they don't put any of this shit back in the right spot. I just, I don't know. It's like, come on, pay attention to details. You know, there's a reason to put zip tie. I mean, you probably could put even more zip ties in here to tidy things up even nicer. I mean, it's not, I'll give 
give Piaggio credit, 2018s, they kind of really cleaned some stuff up. But, um, you know, they rely on these zip ties to kind of hold all the wiring. And there's the last one. It holds the starter lead that kind of routes back through all this stuff. So there's the zip ties there. I didn't touch any of these zip ties, zip tie, zip tie. Uh, there's also a zip tie that holds the O2 sensor lead to this hose, but I haven't got to that. So you got one, two, three, four, five, I think it's six or seven of them usually. Just six or seven zip ties usually is my count that I'll go through. And I'll, I can leave the tails for now. We'll come back to it because I got to bleed the coolant. I'll pop a little um, nipple off there. But we'll get to that later. Um, last thing you could do is you reach up, find the uh, spark plug cap, make sure the cap is uh, tight. You know, this is not the, um, the most fun job because you got to kind of reach around, find the, um, the electrode of the spark plug and get that on there. You have all the excitement, you get the motor in, get fluids filled and you go to crank it and uh, oops, spark plug's not connected. It's not all that good for the, um, get a ton of back EMI and RFI radiation from the spark plug cap not being connected. It's kind of dangerous to the electronics on the scooter that run these things without the cap connected. And make sure it clicks on. There it is, I just felt the click. And then it snaps on these newer models. They have a plastic snap that holds the cap. So I got the air box, it's loose right now. Um, keep in mind our um, bolts for the, uh, the swing arm and, and the shock are still loose. Before we get too far, I'll get a wrench out and do that. I have our caliper pulled off to the side. Again, I didn't drain the brake fluid or disconnect this. Uh, the pads still look pretty good. They have about half their life still left on them. Um, go ahead, and if it doesn't want to slip on it, you could kind of rock it back and forth to open up the pads a little bit. I'd get the lower screw in first, and then the upper screw's kind of got a, a slotted hole, so it makes it a little easier to um, line up. Leave the dipsticks loose because every reminder that you give yourself that you don't have oil in it is a good important reminder. So two fasteners there. We'll deal with those when the belt cover's on. Same with that one. This is the ideal time if you need to check the air filter. Uh, air filter's loose. This is a good time to check it, clean it. Uh, not too much oil. I already looked in there. That's just normal. Um, Oftentimes, if you had a blown engine, the air box could be filled with oil and all sorts of other fun stuff. Torque these 16 foot-pounds. Kind of critical since they are a brake fastener. We have all the transmission parts ready to go. Everything's all cleaned up. Go ahead and put the variator together. And again, this is all repeat information. If you watch the other videos, I'm not gonna talk about much, but open clockwise for these rollers. I already checked these rollers are still, they're used, but they're still in serviceable condition. No issues there. These little guides only go one direction. They are still in decent enough shape. Drop this on, the is of course in good shape. I mean, a lot of times if you're overhauling an older worn motor, you might find a lot of other parts worn. You know, this, this motor just had one issue. You know, you, sometimes I rebuild a motor and find a lot of other issues, you know, stuff that was on its way out. I got a brand new uh, belt. belt has a direction on it. This roller is sound, no bearing noise out of that, so that's good. That all in there. Pop the fixed uh, drive pulley. Flat washer, Belleville washer, 
This is torqued uh, about 60, 65 foot pounds. Shouldn't ever have any issues with it coming loose. The factory tool in there, there's the Bazzetti tool that I've shown in many of the videos. This is a factory tool, 020626Y is the part number on that. And I'm gonna hold it. There's actually, there's a um, thing that bolts to the barrier, makes it um, stay in place a little bit more. Thirty-five, forty-five, fifty-eight, sixty-two. Perfect. All right. Put the drum on. Believe it or not, I've heard of people starting them without that on there. It completely destroys the clutch. Belt cover's all good. This bearing checks out okay. Dowels are all in the belt cover. Fold the belt cover on. Make sure your ground wire is not pinched. Got the single bolt. You see, it was not that big a deal putting the, uh, the cover all back together with the um, with the engine back installed. And, and the motor's just ever so slightly lighter, easier mo mo maneuver when it's um, when it doesn't have all the components bolted to it. All right, so this is the hose clamp and they changed the design of this several times over the years. Um, at first, one time they didn't have it at all, and then they had a very short one. And then there's been two iterations where they lengthened this bracket. I guess they've had issues or something, so. Have the hose clamped in there, no big deal. Look at the uh, ground wire. Before you even think about bolting the air box, again, shock bolts are loose. Get a single shock bolt. Got that screw. This breather hose goes on top of the uh, brake cable. Got the other brake cable clamp. Pop that through. You know, and if I wanted to rush this a little bit more, I could use a power tool to zip those all on. But um, just, I'll just use what I got out already, so. And guess what? I guess I'm missing the sunset. Looks pretty uh, overcast out now. And there's San Diego for you. Not always sunny here. So no sense in really dropping that into place, but just want to see if it fits. Um, the little filter's been cleaned up. You got two screws. Make sure you don't drop anything down the, um, the oil drain when that's open. My Phillips over here. Kind of spin that, get it closed. I'm just turning the disc brake. I don't even have a wheel on it. 45 foot pounds. There we go. See how that little thing's popped out? I don't like that. Get my nails under there. See that? Just needs to turn a little bit. Ah, that one's popped out. I'm losing today. There we go. Now I'm happy. Got the exhaust manifold. Um, this tray, originally I had this on this side, so it has all the hardware that I would need. That's what's left of the air box stuff. I'm gonna get some wrenches to do both um, the swing arm pivot bolt and the, um, the air box. So this is what I do is before I even get the wheel on there, put a 13 millimeter on one side of the, of the uh, 
that's a nylock, so you gotta kind of fight it a little bit as you're, um, and that's there for, if the nut was loose, it went back off. And about 25, 30 foot pounds there. This side I'll hold with the, uh, the socket and move on to the other side. Sometimes the wrench will just stay in place and stop against the, um, the center stand. Other times it won't. And there we go. Don't need to over tighten that. If, if you torque that thing to 80 foot pounds, which is way too much, that would be a dangerous situation. You'd be stretching the, um, the pivot bolt and it could possibly break. So sometimes over torquing things is not a good idea. Uh, airbox can snap back onto place. We got a couple different fasteners, or just two different ones. There's one longer one, that's this front, and it happens to be a Phillips, and then the two rear ones are have Torx heads on them. And, and sometimes just getting all this stuff to line up. Yeah, this is, there we go. Don't get too crazy and just torque the first nut, get everything in. This is your wheel speed sensor. I left that, that nut or bolt lo loose on the, um, this fender here. So pull the bolt out. And only 2015 and later we'll have this uh, sensor like this for the ABS system and wheel speed. So there's a notch in the uh, thing and then this little guy can't really see what I'm doing, but it's a bracket that that holds uh, the little connector harness in, in place. All right. Got the spark plug lead, got the uh, exhaust manifold. Got two nuts for that. Um, these brass nuts are pretty inexpensive if they're really rusty, but they're actually, they're still nuts, but they're brass or copper coated um, for the high temperature. If they look bad, then just order new ones, replace them. So all I'm doing is right now is just putting this in, in place. And up here is the connector for the, uh, the O2 sensor. And you kind of got to feel your way around. You may have better luck looking at it from the top, but I've done this a number of times, so I can kind of just feel my way around, find it. Uh, I would say, I think it's 2010 through 2017, it's a two wire connect uh, O2 sensor. And 2006 through 2009 and 2018, and presumably later, later they have a four wire sensor. Um, so different part numbers for these based on, and then you got carbureted, non emissions compliant stuff that does not have the sensors. So there's a little clamp that holds the, um, the sensor in place. Make sure you put that on there. Just keeps it from dropping down and melting on the header. Uh, that was put onto the water pump cover. This hose here, Again, it would be, the job would be a little easier if I didn't have the skirt in the way, but uh, I'll suffice, I'll be fine. So get that on there. And the hose goes all the way down. This hose clamp is, I don't know, within 15 millimeters of the end of the rubber on the, the hose. Something like that. Get your uh, tire, just like doing a tire change. Get that in place. And like I said, different years, they have different arrangements for the, uh, the wheel nuts. Uh, you can see I left all the washers in place. So nothing has really changed here. Yeah, make sure all those washers are in place. 
and 13. Guess what? They're started and I haven't used electric tool for a while. Look how much faster that is. I got lazy there. There we go. Torque wrench. 16 foot pounds. And a lot of times you just hold the wheel. Skip a fastener or two. Just remember that where you left off. And this one's the last one. All right. All torqued. A little bit more anti seize just for for grins. All right, so this plate goes on, the bearing feels good, no issues there. Sight this it's up. One more little short spacer, that big nut, two Allens. Allen, Allen. Oh, you know what I did wrong? I was thinking this bike was either a later ABS model, getting ahead of myself. Oopsie. Jumping the gun. Robot Russian, there you go. So the tone wheel needs to go on after I put those studs on. See, I'm, I'm, I'm on, uh, I'm like beyond third base right here. So I'm just trying to get the home run right now. So I'm kind of rushing. I know Scott wants to get out of here. I do too. Normally I like staying here all the time, but can't do that all the time. All right. And these are all, you'll need your T25. There's little screws. Definitely just want to start them just to, um, All right, now we're now we're in business. Swing arm cover. Allen's nut there. Try to do two things at once. Six millimeter Allen and around sixteen foot pounds. Sensor. And these little clampies for the All those little uh, bolts are all the same. Same length, same size, little M5s. Don't get too crazy, they'll break if you over tighten them. Lower shock. And a big washer. Only thing I haven't tightened. Again, if you want to torque this, it'd be like 25, 30 foot pounds for a good, sounds about right. This I will use a torque wrench. Um, in one of the middle holes of the, uh, the disc, you find one that just lines up perfectly. 
It will wedge perfectly right up against the caliper. Safely do that. There's a lot of times you don't want to do a technique like that by jamming things up, but this is, you know, there's nothing that's uh, on any sharp edges or anything that's fragile. So, and torque that to about 80 foot pounds. Cutter pan. And if you see, you kind of just ro rotate the wheel so it gives the cutter pin a nice little round. I don't know. You don't have to get that crazy with it, but whatever. It's kind of something fun and different. All right, not too many fasteners left. This was something I pulled out. That was extras I don't need that I pulled from inventory or stock. All we have is a muffler fastener. That's good. No extras. So I'm gonna loosen the clamp. Kinda always wanna replace this, these muffler bushings. Probably the old one out. I think I have a couple videos where I've done this procedure. This, there's a bushing exodus. I mean, it still has some life in it, but if I'm shipping this bike, you know, I don't want that, I don't want the bushing the fail before the rear tire fails. I mean, the brakes, they have about 50% life, but the guy's gonna need, you know, his, his uh, rear tire, the next rear tire is gonna be, um, once it's worn out, he'll probably need brakes next time. And I'll put that in the notes. So the exhaust expander. The newer style bushings have that kind of stuff on the end. And a lot of times, if you expand it just perfectly, you can just use your fingers to push it in there, so. Um, a lot of times, even before I put this all together, put some anti-seize, I'll make sure this thread's in. These clamps sometimes, there's been ones that we've had to cut off because they've seized up. So I'll get the screw in there. Don't forget my uh, exhaust manifold's still loose right now. So you can kind of aim it where it needs to be. And it slides right on, nice. Put the, uh, the fasteners. Just, I'm holding the muffler up. Let's get them all started. And a T40 Torx. And you can go ahead and tighten the muffler before. I'm not gonna do the clamp until I get the header tight. All right, so I went between that one. It's about 11 foot pounds is what you would torque these to, but a little wrench, there we go. So um, get the clamp and you want the clamp kind of in a position where it will cover up the, um, the slots. I think there's a 19, there we go. We have a 17. So 17 millimeter wrench, tighten the clamp. So the, since the engine, we're just reusing the old top end, um, I'm gonna put the full synthetic, the specified oil for this engine in, 5W40 full synthetic. Um, it's probably gonna take a little bit more capacity than it normally would. Yeah, you know, oil change, it would be a liter and a quarter usually at the tops. I'll probably put a liter and a third in it. So a uh, lot easier than pouring it in, but whatever, this is the way we do it here at the shop. There we go. So dipstick reads a little high, but once the motor, it circulates through everything, we'll double check the oil level and top it off or even drain if necessary. So dipstick's back in there. Our gearbox oil. I'll put, uh, getting kind of low on the oil there. I put, maybe let's see where 200 puts us. 
was again, it was a drained uh, gearbox. So, this is a nice handy, it's a big syringe specifically for this. Makes the job a lot easier than pouring it in with a little funnel or using a small syringe. But a small syringe is perfectly adequate if you're only doing this every year or two years or whatever. So thread the dipstick in and it's perfect. It's right at the tip. Start filling the motor or the re reservoir, excuse me, with coolant and watch the engine. Make sure there's nothing dripping. You know, I look at it, the worst thing is you fill the whole system up and you find a leak. And there's been times where I've had a real minor leak from a newly rebuilt water pump and I've also seen real minor leaks from the head gasket and after you do the first heat cycle um, oftentimes it'll seal right up but whenever I have a situation like that I'm a little wary and may do as many as three or four heat cycles. I filled it right to the full mark but it's definitely going to take a little bit more than that. I have a, a napkin underneath the engine or, or paper towels. I'm gonna uh, could hook a little hose to that but I tend just to uh, let it leak on the engine a little bit, pull it out. Engine's completely dry with um, coolant. Give a little shake. I already see the coolant level drop below. It's below the low mark, so it's, it's pushing air out of the system right now. Give it a little shake sometimes. Sometimes even speed up the process. I'll just pull the whole um, bleeder out. Uh, also, sometimes starting a motor will help get, get the air out of the system. I'll need another coolant bottle, 50-50 mix, you know, it's not, not just straight coolant. I think it's ethyl glycol coolant. All right being a little stubborn so is what I'll do is I'll start the, uh, the bike and up here I'm gonna just put my finger over I'm gonna close the seat but you want to look make sure that oil light is um, is on so that indicates your oil pressure sensor is hooked up and I'm gonna crank it start it right up watch that oil light should go out Now the oil light's out after a couple seconds of operation, so it's a little noisy on the lift, but oh, see now, now there's uh, spraying coolant all over the place, so all, you know, once it started, pump started pumping, got a little bit of steam because I leaked a little coolant on the um, exhaust, no big deal, so sometimes it just needs a little start to get the, um, coolant through the system. Uh, motor sounds perfect. I don't, I don't hear anything abnormal from it. It kind of has, there's a nice sweet aroma in the air from the coolant that's leaked onto the exhaust pipe. So right now it's it's right up to the full mark. You can see it right there. It's a little difficult to see, but go ahead and put the cap on. And I'm not going to bother putting the uh, the cover on, you know, because I'm going to take this scooter on a couple test rides, verify the repairs, make sure there's no leaks anywhere, not losing coolant, make sure the coolant level's good after I um, I start it. A couple things to check while you're on the motor here. Um, you know coolant's uh, circulating. If this hose is warm over here, that means coolant is moving around in the system. You can also put your hands up on both radiators. You should, you should feel uh, heat starting to uh, build in both radiators. So it's something you definitely want to check. Give it a couple little revs. It's got the trash control on, so let me turn that. Motor's nice and quiet. I'm at the most of the noise I hear is is the vibration on the lift. You know, pretty normal. Come back, check your um, oil level. 
you know, check the whole bottom of the engine for any, any leaks, you know, after a test ride, after it cools down. And I think we're doing pretty good. A couple other things you might check is, you know, put a voltmeter across your battery, make sure your battery's charging, there might be a loose connection there. Um, if you have any other issues where it won't start, you know, double check all the connections for the, anything to do with the fuel injection system. Uh, double check your fuses. If you left the battery hooked up and accidentally turned ignition on and had something crossed up, it would blow a fuse. Um, that's pretty much kind of summarizes doing a complete engine overall on, I don't know, most any Vespas, but specifically on the Vespa GT200, GTS250, GTS 300, Super, GTV, any of those models. I hope everybody found something useful in there. I know it's like a three-part series that's quite long. Uh, whether you're a seasoned mechanic that just want to skip through and watch some of my techniques, hopefully those are helpful to you. Or maybe you know nothing about mechanical stuff. I mean, that's super cool that you want to just like check it out. You know, I don't know. It's like, I'm always intrigued. I'm, a, I like, I'm kind of a nerd. I like to know what's inside a computer and all that. but. I'm not a programmer by any means. I've done some real basic programming, but you know, there's a lot of stuff that ticks in a computer and understanding as there is in something like this. And with a mecha something mechanical, it's pretty easy to see, you know, how everything li linked up mechanically makes a whole operational scooter that you know motor down the highway at 120 kilometers, 75 miles an hour. Um, see everybody next time. Uh, one thing I didn't cover was the water pump vi uh, rebuild. I'm going to do a separate video on the water pump rebuild. Uh, see everybody at the next rally. Stop by the shop. Say hi to our gang over here in San Diego, Vespa Motorsport, scooterwest.com. Till next time.